Greetings, podcast powerhouses. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And right now, that means we're talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from multiple angles you will only find on this podcast feed. Our story cast this week got into the latest episode's theme of whether might makes right and the ways it uses noir archetypes to fuel the story. On Character Cast, we analyzed Sharon and Zemo, both of whom have some good and bad sides, and we checked in with Sam and Bucky's journeys. This, of course, is PonderVision. This show looks both forward and backwards to the questions we can't escape from last episode and the ones we're most obsessed with for the episode ahead. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and I am joined, as always, by the Zemo family attorney, Jesse Taylor. Hey, Jesse. Hey, oh man, does that mean that when you pass the bar, you get a snazzy purple mask? I, I, that seems like an option. It's probably better than joining the special forces. I was just thinking, how bad do you think that mask smelled? Well, it's so it's uh, got a certain rigidity to it. Perhaps that's just a lot of sweat and accumulated body oh. fluids from Zemo. That like your, keeps it so like your end of winter hat that you haven't oh. washed at all? Yeah, oh. it's just like a, like a dead raccoon in there. It's grim. <laughs> so... Baron Zemo did say that the nation of Sokovia is gone now, totally gobbled up by its neighbors, which is something we have been speculating about. And I find it fascinating. We also got a hint of Latvia, which is very much not the other place. But does all of this open the door for another fictional country to rise up in its place? Jesse, I'm asking you, are we about to get in the MCU a little getaway known as Latveria? I think we are. It's setting it up for what? When's the movie coming out? Twenty twenty three, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so we'll. we'll I think we'll get a, a name drop, maybe you know, in Quantumania or in or in something else, where it'll just be like, there's this weird little country named Latveria, and who knows what's going on there? Because the MCU has one way, and pretty much only one way of introducing one of the fictional countries, mm. which is that a character just has to name drop it really, really conspicuously, <laughs> and then all of a sudden becomes relevant. Yeah, well, we've already got Mad Rapport, so the fictional spaces right. are cropping up. As usual, we're going to get into four areas of questions. Our biggest question, our weirdest questions, our most meta question, and our most uncomfortable questions for each other. But there's one big question we have to talk about Jesse, why is this episode titled Power Broker? It's someone we didn't see on screen, although his or her influence is everywhere. What is going on with that title? Where does that come from? What is this telling us? Well, I think it's setting us up to watch for clues. So far, this has been a show that hasn't been very clue oriented. Okay. It's been, I don't want to say it's been straightforward necessarily. Uh, there have been some twists and turns. But this was the first episode where it did sort of feel like we were watching WandaVision again, where you're looking around and you have sort of the obvious clue, seeing the power broker as a watching sign on the wall. But then you're also trying to figure out, okay, they're referring to power broker as he. Is that known or is that speculation? When they go to the lab where the super, the super soldier serum is made, what are we, do we see anything there that might hint as to who the power broker is? And I know that we've talked about this, and you have some some theories about who the power broker might be. Well, you know I laid out the case for Mitchell Carson in the past. That's the guy from Ant-Man who used to work with Hank Pym, who came in basically post-Hydra to try and buy up Darren Cross's tech. That was the obvious one that, yeah. you know, everybody's talking about. Just you can't even you can't even Google power broker without seeing Mitchell Carson. Wait, are you being sarcastic? Do other people really believe this? No, nobody believes this. Okay, okay. I was like, wait, no, I thought that was like my thing, man. I thought that was like yeah, my thing. Yeah. It's completely your thing. Okay, cool. I Look, I thought Mr. Carson was a cool guest. I thought it'd be a fun reveal. Obviously, at this point, that seems probably off the table. If you, anyone listened to Character Cast, you will know that I'm now on the Sharon is Power Broker thing. So I think part of why this episode might have been titled Power Broker is because we did actually meet the Power Broker. Sharon is paying attention to everything. She's super rich. She has a secret driver who even our heroes don't find out about. And the real kicker for me was everything around finding out about Nagel. Not only is she living in a super fancy mansion with a bunch of cool stolen art, she tells her heroes to stay away from her. She'll figure out this thing that Selby told us was nearly impossible to figure out. And when they get inside that, you know, shipping container, 
They're like, are we sure this is the right place? And Sharon's like, definitely, basically, this is the right place. And then when he dies, she's like, what have you done? And what does she say to her driver when she gets out of there? We have problems, a couple of them. I'll tell you later. And it's like, I don't know. Is she the power broker? It's possible. And one of the things we know about the MCU, and especially this show, is that they're willing to take characters that you would know as sort of a, a a deep lore person in the comics and make substantial changes to them. Like even Sam's alter ego was a really bad villain from New Warrior slash Thunderbolts who they changed into kind of a side character that Sam was pretending to be. You're talking about Smiling Tiger. Yeah. And so we know that, you know, if they were going to be completely comics oriented, the Smiling Tiger would be, you know, like a, a five foot ten guy covered in yellow fur with no nose and red <laughs> eyes. That's not who we got. I would have loved to have seen Sam in that outfit, just running around with a bunch of prosthetic fur and maybe some cool eye contacts. And what I would have loved is if it had been for no point at all. Parents was like, no, no, you got to you got to be this guy. Like, this is what he looks like. <laughs> and it was just a drawing he had on his phone. Oh, my God. And then he has to walk around making weird animal sounds in the bar. That would have been very enjoyable. Um, yeah. No, but look, Christine made the case that Zola might be our power broker because, as she said, they named dropped Erskine. He's very closely associated with Zola, who is basically his counterpart in first avenger or close to it and it may be the case that uh zola could pop back up he certainly would have been the right person to get that bitcoin bounty on everyone's phone in like two seconds is there a compelling case for zola i'm not sure if only because we only have three episodes left and as we saw in this episode this episode did a lot it moved forward a lot of storylines and we are at the point in the spy movie narrative where we have a lot of cogs and a lot of moving characters. I'm not sure from a storyline perspective, it necessarily makes sense to bring in Zola and have to explain that backstory. But then again, if the power broker is somebody we've never seen before, just a character that's sort of out of nowhere, suppose it is Curtis Jackson from the comics. How do you explain that? What is the payoff to that if it's not somebody we haven't seen before? So I actually think Zola would make more sense than having it be more comics focused and having it be Curtis Jackson. Unless they can give Curtis Jackson a really, really good backstory to tie him in and make it have some sort of impact beyond him just being the guy from the comics that you might know. It would feel weird to meet this person in episode five or something when it's not titled Power Broker and wonder why this episode has this title. It's the question I keep coming back to because, sure, they influence a lot of the things that happen, but titles like The Star-Spangled Man really applied to so many characters in the episode and it just feels weird to me that this title is hanging out there like a like a chad on a vote that isn't going to get counted and cost us an election that transforms all of american history wait sorry i'm getting getting off track yeah. for for all of our our young listeners that's referring to the 2000 election which is now 21 years ago oh my god kill me in the face jesse wow yeah. oh look I actually think this was one of the tighter episodes, which is why I was asking that question. But it also means a lot of my big questions got answered, which is why, Jesse, I want to get into our weird questions. I have oh yeah, so many things in this episode open up the possibility of weird questions. And looking forward, I also think it opened the door to some other things to think about. I want to start with something small, though, which is this. We joked a little bit last time about Leia and Zemo, and I thought that was fun and great. I really enjoyed that little aside. However, we got another Star Wars hook for Zemo in this episode. I don't know about you, but that purple shirt was throwing me major Jedi robe vibes. Was I the only one picking up on that? Is that just me and my weird brain? What's going on with that? Why is he dressed in a Jedi robe shirt? Well, I think you just really want to watch Star Wars. God damn it. Maybe. That might be the answer. I love the way he dressed this episode, even if I didn't get Star Wars vibes from it. Like, I want his jacket. I want his jacket for my post-pandemic look. Oh, it was cool. The fur collar. Christine was out on the fur collar. I'm in on the fur collar jacket. The mask, I'm pretty out on. The jacket, sign me up. And he looks so cool in the car and supercharged, you know? Like, let's go, buddy. Yeah. One of the things I'm I'm wondering about with the purple mask, is it like when he goes into murder mode? Mm. So, you know, he's a normal guy and then he puts on the mask and it's like Zemo's going to kill everybody because I, I didn't 
that was one thing I didn't necessarily get from it. It's like, what did the mask signify other than him looking like a com looking like the comic book character? It definitely seemed to have some kind of psychological effect on him, I guess is what I would say, because he walked around on the streets of, you know, major European cities, like no big deal that I'm a wanted person who escaped from prison. He flew his private plane that presumably would be able to be tracked and was like, who cares? And I've just brought my butler out of retirement and surely nobody's tracking his movements after I've escaped from prison, right? So it does feel odd that the one time he dons a mask, is in the place where nobody's out to get him. And honestly, with all the explosions going on, nobody's looking for him. I guess that there is going to be some kind of legacy, maybe back to his dad or something like that. Because in the comics, right, the Baron Zemo we get for most of the, you know, silver and bronze age is the son of the Baron Zemo who showed up in early Avengers comics and fought Cap. Yeah, so I just think there could be some tie to the family with that thing. I hope there's a good story behind it because... I tried to love it and I just came up short. Yeah. And that that was what I was waiting for is for him to flip a switch. Yeah. Or something that gave the mask a little bit more meaning than it maybe just being the crusty mask that was in his car from five or six years prior. Well, look, I'm still on this Jedi robe trip and I'll tell you why, because I think he was messing with everyone's minds. Honestly, I think he pulled Jedi mind tricks on everybody, made them think he was mostly on their side, that he could be trusted. He kept getting away with shit, like killing Nagel in front of them and being like, hey, you need me, right? And everyone's like, yeah, of course, which is basically the equivalent of these are not the droids you're looking for. Yeah. What the hell? He's just working everybody over mentally. And maybe that car was his speeder. Yeah, exactly. See, now you're on my page. This is what I'm here for. This is my ponder vision. Okay, not really. Jesse, give me a real weird question that we can sink our teeth into. So, obviously, Baron Zemo had been planning this jailbreak for years. <laughs> to the point where after, they, after he meets up with Sam and Bucky, they go to his post-jailbreak supervillain lair. He's got all of his classic cars, his gold guns, which... You know, uh, uh, if I'm going to be a supervillain, I'm having a gold gun. Like, mm -hmm. that's just, that's a, you know. <laughs> that's just in the, uh, start, the Jesse Taylor starter kit. Like, yes. when you open it up, it's like cool mask, golden gun. Yeah. Right. So, here's my question for you. You've been in prison for five, six years, having committed, you know, one of the most internationally famous crimes of all time. You break out. What is in your post-jailbreak supervillain layer? Okay, so my post-jailbreak supervillain layer. Broadly speaking, I think there are three kinds of layer, right? You have an island layer, an underground layer, or like some kind of manor, castle, or fortress. I took Zemo's layer to be one that was kind of underground-ish. Yeah, there was the car garage up top, but it was like where secret cars were and everything felt a bit like one of those multi-tiered basement situations where everything was packed away. If we're thinking of Sharon as a supervillain, I think she had one of the manor types where it was like, I have this cool apartment and it's probably a big old penthouse and big enough to hu host, host this huge dance party with DJs and shit. I would choose the island layer. Give me that shit. Because Sharon is way too exposed in, in her building. Like she maybe, maybe even shares walls. And if we learned anything from the flashback that we got with Bucky in episode one, you do not want shared walls with potential enemies. That shit is right out. On an island, I want radar and sonar to tell me when people who might be hunting me to bring me back to jail will be coming for me. So that's what I want an island for. Give me that space away from everybody else. And by the way, I'll take sun for 325 days a year because I've probably been in solitary in one of those weird underground or underwater prisons. They put all the cool supervillains in. I will say I do like Sharon's high ceilings, so I'd probably copy that. And maybe have like increasingly difficult panic rooms so that if people do find me and they want to come take me back to jail, there's like a Russian doll version of hideout spaces. And inside of each is maybe like cool hobbies that I have. And so as I descend deeper and deeper, I can entertain myself as I hold back and presumably my army of henchmen are trying to end the surge on my base. So that's kind of where I landed on my post jailbreak island with sonar and radar cool Russian doll panic rooms with all of my hobbies inside so I can hold out as long as possible. Jesse, I assume you have an answer to this too. Well, first, I like the fact that we're coming up with an HGTV show right now. Like design your lair, like... Exactly. It can be like house hunters, you know, like I'm a dog walker and I'm an unemployed piano tuner. We have 
seven million dollars because of our villainy. <laughs> and so, first, I think I think you're right about the three kinds of layer. And I'm thinking okay. immediately post jailbreak. I want the underground. And the reason I want the underground is because it's the least detectable one. The mansion is obvious, especially if I'm a baron. Like people are going to say, you know, here's your ancestral castle or your summer home with all your horses, whatever. I'm assuming that's how barons live. Sounds right. So I'm not going to go there. I, that's the dumbest place to go. Like you're immediately going to end up back in lockdown after that. Your island, I feel like same issue. Uh, and after five years and five years, five to six years with the blip, there could be squatters on the island. Who knows? Sure. I feel like the underground is your safest bet, your safest, most secure bet. Yeah, you're right. Because I could get pirates on the island while I'm gone and then I come back and I have to deal with the pirates and I might not be in a condition to deal with the pirates because I don't have my henchmen yet because I've been off the payroll. So, yeah. Okay. All right. That's a good point. Yeah. And, you know, I've got my golden gun, but do I necessarily want to have to use my golden gun right away? No. I want to admire it's it. probably got a signature bullet that could get traced back to you. Yeah. Right. That I've been saving for my arch nemesis who put me behind bars. Like, let's hmm. let's be clear about what the purpose of the golden gun is. So, <laughs> I want the underground layer. I want, I want a coffee bar. I want, like, the world's most ornate French press slow drip, whatever. Because I'm assuming the coffee in jail has been awful. I didn't realize you were a coffee snob, Jesse Taylor. I'm not usually, but I feel like after five years, like the thing that I want, if I'm, if I've got millions of dollars or billions of dollars, however much money Baron Zemo has, I want the best cup of coffee. Like that's what I've been saving up for. That's what I've been looking for. Okay. Not a big car person. I don't necessarily care about having, you know, 20 vintage cars. If they meant something to me, maybe, but I'd be fine with like, you know, give me a Toyota Highlander, something inconspicuous. I'll just like, you know head out and roll around town i feel like in the marvel universe everyone has a black gmc suv or whatever exactly like you'd never know because there would just be 500 of them on the streets at any given time and i think the only other thing that i would want is like a california king-sized bed turned down ready to go with like a tv pulled up to stream something because if I've been in prison for five, I don't, I haven't been watching anything or if I have, it's been like whatever the white supremacist gang wanted. Like, I just want to watch what I want to watch and lay down and just like take some pain off of my back for a little bit. Because I'm assuming the cot's, cotton jail has been bad too. So when I get to the deepest layer of my panic room, I definitely want floor to ceiling screen with a PS5 and like a whole row of charged up controllers so I can just go nuts because I'm assuming a bunch of cool games have come out. Maybe I haven't played the Miles Morales Spider-Man. I definitely want to get on that. And I can just hang out in there again, hoping that everyone gets bored of trying to hunt me down inside. So I feel like you got to have a PS5 in your your boudoir, Jesse, if you want to have Max and relaxing. I also thought of one other thing that I want is a series Mm. of ornate outfits that fit with my supervillain motif. Okay. Do you have a supervillain motif? I don't, but you know, Baron Zemo does. Like, okay. although it would be kind of a bunch of like old, crusty, purple ribbed robes, like not necessarily what I'd want to wear, but maybe that's his thing. Maybe that's what he loves. Actually, no, fur lined robes because he's got the fur lined jacket. He does. Yeah. All right. It's interesting that you went to the post jailbreak layer because I went somewhere else when I was watching this episode and having my fantasies about the thing that I would own or have or create. And that would be my bar in Madripoor. So I want to ask you, what would be the concept or theme of your Madripoor bar? Hmm. Well, I feel like the bar that they went to has the rare animal organs and a shot glass motif, which is going to be my first choice. Yeah, that one's covered. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You were, I know we were always talking about how to gut animals, preferably endangered, to have their testicles in cocktails. It's definitely a common part of our group chats and whatnot yeah post pandemic like i'm coming for you bar oh my so, god i gotta say it seems like the whole cd dive bar scene is pretty much covered in madripoor okay what do you, how do you feel about an ironic family restaurant in madripoor holy shit like a midtown irish bar or like an applebee's or something exactly like just jalapeno poppers but you know given that it's a crime syndicate town like covered in gold leaf 
Considering how many people wind up in Madripoor because they basically got booted from their home country and clearly several of them would be American, you might get a huge nostalgia customer base. I actually think you could do pretty well. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Sharon Carter, you know, uh, super American until she got hunted down by international crime syndicates. And And let's be honest, she seemed kind of basic, so she could have been into a Chili's. Right. And so imagine if you could like market to her, you know, you're an international art dealer. Here's a Kobe beef set of sliders, uh, some garlic fries with aioli. Okay. And, you know, like an ice cold Diet Coke. She'd go crazy (laughs) for that. (laughs) Yeah, it has to be like the fountain Diet Coke. Nothing from the bottle or can. I went a different route because my goal is to not die. And the one thing the Chili's Applebee's doesn't solve is what happens when people start getting violent in your bar, which we saw in this episode happens quite a bit. So I think I'd go for an Alice in Wonderland theme because I want it to be cool, but also I want everyone to be tripping balls the whole time because I think LSD and ecstasy are 100% the way to like get this crowd to chill out. So every drink would come with like a free tab of acid And then I just want a bunch of zoned out hard asses. And then I would have my security guys dress up in optical illusion outfits that would really fuck with people's brains on hallucinogens. That way they'd just be completely weirded out anytime I needed to have one of them tossed out of the bar. And I think that could lead to my supervillain personality, which would be in that case called the illusion. How's that sound? No, you're laughing. All right, fine. All right, I'll I'll keep working on it. I'll keep working on it. Fine. (laughs) I mean, I like it. I feel like it would be appealing to uh, a very dedicated subset. Yeah. Uh, My only worry is that if your clientele is tripping balls from the moment they walk in, like, (laughs) how do you how do you get those second or third drinks? How do you get them to order dessert? Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. They're just going to be sitting in the booths for seven hours doing nothing. (laughs) Yep. You know, okay, here's how you get here's no look, look, here's the business model. It's like, you know how like, a lot of people who give you free stuff on the web or in apps are basically in the data mining business, right? They What they actually make money on is mining your personal data. So my bar is all about where you come to have like a trippy chill time. And then I just sell your location if you have a bounty on you to someone for like half the fee. And then I set you up and you're like tripping balls in your booth and then you're easy target. So I'm what I'm actually doing is culling out some of the bad people who have bounties on them and catching some of that fee have i got you roped back into the illusions alice in wonderland bar i want to i want to see a business model can you have one prepared for me by tomorrow i'll get right on i'm gonna contact my guys in madripoor um and see if they can get me some uh, bitcoin to fire this thing up look i'm serious i think bars in madripoor would be really really fun because you don't need a bunch of permits and it's i don't know get creative that's all i'm saying is expand your mind beyond applebee's jesse that's what what i'm asking (laughs) weird questions keep going so we know that bitcoin exists yeah and we know that murderous bad guys pay bounties in bitcoin we've talked about that before in this very pod Yes, and it it pays off with a lot of our theories. So we know that in Spider-Man 3, whatever it's going to be called, uh, he is going to be one of the most wanted people in the world for having allegedly murdered Mysterio. Okay. Is the bounty for Spider-Man going to be an NFT? And if so, what is the NFT? So you're saying someone would be able to claim a prize or something that is an NFT. First of all, I want to put you on the spot and make you try to explain NFTs to the audience. Do that. See what you got. Okay. So NFTs are non-fungible tokens. And as best I understand them, it's like somebody took a JPEG that you could download from Google at any point, specially encrypted it, and that special encryption then makes it worth a lot more than the JPEG. But you can still show anybody the NFT even after you buy it. But because you've bought it and have the encryption code or key or whatever, I don't know how that part works. It's then worth like $70 million. Yeah, basically NFTs are the equivalent of having like a certificate of ownership for something that is on the blockchain. So people who might have heard of NBA Top Shot, for example, is this thing where you can literally buy gifts of NBA highlights and they're individually serialized with their numbers. And some of them even only have like one copy out there. Now, I can't stress this enough. You can go onto the site where people are selling them and look at the GIFs in really high resolution so you can completely interact with the product 
for free. The only thing the NFT represents is a certificate of ownership that is on the blockchain, which makes it very hard for somebody to replicate or steal because it's decentralized all over the world. And that's the value. I honestly don't understand how this is feels like ownership. When again, I, I love this LeBron highlight. Great. I just want to go look at it. I, I don't know how owning the NFT works, but really, I'm not sure how much different it is than a baseball card inside of a little case or even a comic book inside of a little case. It's just a way to say I have a copy of something. And in this case, the only copy, which is why they sell for so much money. That's why I don't see how you could say like, oh, Spider-Man's bounty is an NFT because what you want is the money to you want to get paid if you kill Spider-Man. So the NFT would have to be like, have some other value attached to it. And so I can't really see that connection. But I'll tell you what I do think NFTs would start doing in the MCU. I 100% think villains could start trading the rights to arch nemeses as NFTs, which is kind of something from the Venture Brothers, but I think would actually work here. So imagine that basically the rights to be Spider-Man's arch nemesis are for sale. And if you have this certificate of ownership that is impossible to fake on the internet because of the decentralization of the blockchain, you can prove that you are Spider-Man's number one foe. And in places like Madripoor, that might be really cool. You're like, hey, nobody else is Spider-Man's arch nemesis. That's me. Or Thor is my guy and I'm fighting gods. And this certificate says that. Hell, Loki feels like the perfect person to run this scheme. What do you think? I really like it. In that case, whose hero's rights would be the most valuable? Hmm. We're going present day MCU without any of the additional people we know are coming, but haven't come yet. I'll allow anyone with like a confirmed series or anything like that. But Tony Stark has already passed on. So let's go with like present and future MCU. We're a forward looking show here, Jesse. Okay. I'm going to say Doctor Strange because he is the Sorcerer Supreme. So there's also that title that's added to it. And we know now, I'm not sure if people even know Thor where Thor is or if Thor still exists. True. Um, and to the extent he is, he's like kind of depressed video game Thor, not necessarily like the fighting Thor that we all came to know and love. Nobody wants John Walker. Like that might just get passed around from person to person. It's like that gift that you get every Christmas that somebody gave to you last year and then you rewrap it and give it to someone else. No, but you and I are on opposite sides here. Not only do I have Dr. Strange as my least valuable I have John Walker as my most valuable. Let me explain both. For Doctor Strange, he's very hard to kill, and he is absolutely no fun. He doesn't really banter that much. He just is kind of a sourpuss. I honestly don't think arching Doctor Strange would be a good time. Arching John Walker would be a fucking blast. First of all, he's incompetent. Second of all, everyone already hates him, and you could turn out to be kind of a hero if you kill John Walker. So buying the rights to be the guy who gets the rights to kill John Walker while everybody else has to wait their turn, I actually feel like that's the one I would want to buy if I was a terrible person, because who would really be mad at you? See, that's interesting, because you took it as you have, you're looking at it as you have the rights to kill that person. And... I was looking at it as that you have the right to or you have the title slash the honor of being that person's arch nemesis. So Yeah, you're right. And I did set it up that way. I but I just took it to the dark place right away. You know? But no, I like it. And I think that's right. In which case I changed my answer to Hawkeye. <laughs> oh shit, that's so good. Yes. Ah, damn it. Ah, damn it. I forgot about Hawkeye and I never forget about Hawkeye. I love to hate Hawkeye. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Oh man, everyone would be so happy. They'd be like, We miss Natasha. Fuck you. Right. Oh, all right. <sighs> Do I have any other weird questions? I don't think so, Jesse. That means it's time to get meta with it. Jesse, you have a meta question for me? I do. One of the things that comes up every episode with the show is how the audience is going to perceive of the show's commentary on race. And this episode, what stood out to me the most was Zemo's comment when they were in Madripoor regarding Sam's outfit. Sam said he looked like a pimp. And Zemo yeah. said only an American would think that a fashion forward black man looked like a pimp. Now, this is coming from someone whose primary claim to fame slash primary claim to infamy is killing the most powerful black man on the planet 
in an effort to gain political revenge. Mm -hmm. What does that mean coming from him, especially in the sense of him lecturing a black man on how he feels about the way he's presented to the world? I hadn't put this in consideration of the T'Chaka violence. I guess what Zemo would tell you is that T'Chaka was no more or less collateral than anyone else, and that when it comes to murder, he doesn't see color, Jesse. That's what I think Zemo would say. But here's the truth in a meta sense. I think we're meant to see Zemo as both humanized by that line because he really does seem to grasp how fucked up America is. Mm. And it's undeniable, the truth he's speaking. And Sam seems clear on that point as well. But I also think this is a way for him to get into Sam's head and under his skin. Zemo doesn't want another Captain America, especially one that might work. And Sam, honestly, he might work. And I think that's why Zemo tells Sharon, but he's really telling Sam in the same room that Sam also sees the hypocrisy in heroism when they're in Sharon's place. I think that they are trying to show that Zemo is making sure that Sam gets farther away from that shield and that legacy and that title. And he's doing that by driving a wedge between Sam and America. So that's what I honestly think he's doing. I don't know that Zemo actually feels a type of way one way or the other inside. It's all part of his mind games. It might also be challenging viewers to say, if this fucking guy gets these things, if this evil guy can see this, and you haven't thought about it this way before, what does that say about you? What does it say about you if Zemo is more compassionate towards American black folks than you are? I, how I read it as well was Sam looking at the picture of Smiling Tiger, seeing how Smiling Tiger was presented and saying, I do look like that person. And if you think about how Sam has to carry himself, how we've seen Sam be in America, is that he has always had to walk that same line that all African-American men do and all African-Americans do, which is he has to present as non-threateningly as possible, even in a job where he acts in a role where his job is to carry out very effective violence against other people. Mm -hmm. We saw that the very first scene, his he is a soldier and he is a person who can hurt other people uh, and who can use violence to achieve necessary goals. Also part of the reason that he was asked to be Captain America, and maybe part of the reason that he turned it down was also because he didn't want to be in that role. So I think it gets at a lot of Sam's character and how Sam conceives of himself. And also, if you think about it, a good Captain America outfit, not the one we have in this series, but a good one, he would be a fashion forward black man. Yeah. What do you think about the situation with Sam and Cap and the shield, given all of this pressure that's being lumped on him by Zemo and all of this, like at the end of the episode or towards it inside the plane ride, he seems to be, I don't know, absorbing some of what Zemo's talking about here. And I don't, again, think Zemo's necessarily wrong. Yeah. And part of it is that Zemo is reading people. Zemo knows how to read people. That's what makes him an effective manipulator. And it doesn't hurt Zemo's position that the person opposite him is Bucky, who the second he opens his mouth about Sam and his responsibilities, Sam is going to bristle and fall back. And I think you're exactly right that John Walker, if you are a bad guy, if you are someone in this world who wants to see the mantle of Captain America fall by the wayside, at this point, John Walker, you could not have a better ally than John Walker, mm -hmm. at least as far as he's been presented. All right. Well, I've got one meta question for you. I feel like Sam's rescue of the hostage in episode one was really exciting, but it was also pretty violent. I was like, damn, he killed a lot of people, you know, blew up a whole helicopter, threw a dude into a mountain cliff and all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> but holy shit, did it not hold even the slightest of tiniest little tiny bitty candles to Sharon's violent knife and gun spree in this episode. As Christine counted, she killed eight dudes and it wasn't just the number. It was the visceral violence, the, the ways the knives were going into people's chests and just the cold way she was gunning people down. I don't know. It feels like on the whole that this might be Marvel's most violent property. I'm curious if you agree with that. And if so, why you think they might have made that creative choice? I think you're exactly right. And there was actually part of the episode, it wasn't particularly violent, but... When John Walker and the GRC are going into the hideout where Carly Morgenthau had been, and Cap says, 
we're going to go in, we're going to go in, you don't let anybody escape. And it felt low energy. I don't know if you felt mm -hmm. that way too. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about how Steve Rogers would have gone in a room, I mean, he would have been a force <laughs> of nature, barreled in, broken the door down, knocked out six guys, and then found the person that he needed and gotten the information that he needed. Whereas John Walker walks into a room, talks to a guy, basically gets shit on by the guy and doesn't find out anything he needs. And I think part of it is that I've always had this view of the MCU as having two different narrative branches, at least in terms of action. You have the more down to earth action that you find in a Captain America, the epitome of that is the Winter Soldier. Uh, you also find some of that in the first Avenger. Uh, you will probably see the same thing in Black Widow. And then you have the more sort of galactic scale, your Thors, your Guardians of the Galaxies, etc. And so the way that you communicate power and effectiveness in that down to earth set of MCU movies is through violence. And what was kind of shocking about this episode wasn't necessarily the number of people they fought or the fact that they incapacitated them. It's that they showed so clearly the effects of the violence on them. Like it wasn't as if you threw a shield and the person got knocked out. And that's always sort of been the, um, <laughs> right. the way that it's been communicated in Captain America movies. This was, you know, the winter soldier threw a javelin through somebody's arm. Um, <laughs> like people got shot, people got killed. And so part of it too is I think showing that we are in a post captain America world that even if we have these people who are affiliated with captain America by showing the violence in a way that shows it has life altering consequences, or at least it has injurious consequences that you never really saw with Captain America, you know that it's different and you know that the stakes are different. We talked a lot in StoryCast about the theme of this being an interrogation of whether might ever makes right because all these characters are often frequently having to employ violence to achieve ends and sometimes in cases where it may, may or may not be justified. But we also talked a lot about collateral damage. And the more I think about it, the more I think that this entire series is an exploration maybe of the costs of people's actions and the depths of that being so much greater and deeper than they realize. Even little choices, like when Bucky chooses not to tell anyone about Isaiah Bradley, it has these far-reaching consequences for Sam and for their relationship between Sam and Bucky and countless other people who maybe would have benefited from knowing about Isaiah's existence. But everyone in this episode, really, from Sam and Bucky to Sharon and even John Walker, I think, are suffering as collateral damage specifically from Steve Rogers' choices and legacy. So even though, as you were saying, a lot of times we got shields bouncing off guys to knock them unconscious, there's also the result of the shield effectively, figuratively, not literally, but figuratively bouncing off people like Sharon, where they land in Madripoor. And I think that's what this is trying to explore overall. And the violence is part of that. These people are fucking hard now. And I think Sam, Sharon, Bucky, all of it is like, their humanity is kind of at stake. And it's because of their relationship to this shield and now to each other and all the choices they're making have these ripple effects. So that's kind of why I think the violence is there because collateral damage that is this gentle bounce off of a person's head and, oh, maybe they got a little bump, boo-hoo. That's a little different than what's happened to Sharon now, for example. Or even what Sam has to do for the US government, murder a lot of people because he's been on the run and he's got to rebuild his life and he, there's no there's nobody out there you know with a framework to help him do anything else right which is also kind of a commentary on why a lot of people end up joining the military it's mm -hmm. sort of the out that he had once he came back his life was in tatters and it was really the only way he could provide for himself and rebuild his life after both being a fugitive and the blip yeah well look i got to ask a big question this week so as we end on our most uncomfortable question, Jesse, I'm just going to turn it over to you for our uncomfortable question. Do you have something that leaves you a little uneasy as we look ahead to episode four? So I'm a big fan of Paul Verhoeven movies uh, and <laughs> big two being, uh, you know, Robocop, Starship Troopers, also Total Recall. There's a bunch of other movies in there. And 
the intro felt very Starship Trooperish to me. <laughs> um, you have the the rosy ad where you know if you're American, it felt like a pharmaceutical ad. Although if you're in a different country, it might feel like something else. Given that you know you probably don't have a lot of pharmaceutical ads, but it had that very um, you know the GRC is wonderful and great and it's helping everyone get back to normal. And then you see this down on the street level black van pull up with you know, the GRC logo over a German police van, and then Captain America gets out. <laughs> and we know that the goal of the Flag Smashers, to the goal that it's been, to the extent that it's been articulated, is to break down borders and to have, in effect, a one world government or some sort of nation less government. But the GRC, just from those, just from that scene, is starting to feel very one world government ish. So are they oh. actually opposed to the Flag Smashers? Are they just an alternative way of getting at the same goal? Are the Flag Smashers and the GRC fighting for the same goal, but they each want control in their own way? Are they at odds? Yeah, you're right, because I hadn't put together that idea of the German police fan and Captain America, but you're right. Even though I'm sure America is playing a heavy-handed role, it's clearly some kind of collaboration, cooperation among some or all countries. Wow, that's really interesting. First of all, how prescient were we to talk about their weird ass brand last episode? And then we open this one with a terribly corny ad that drives home just how terrible that brand yes. is. I, I don't know about you, but I was pretty tickled when I saw that. I was I was delighted. It makes it it felt as if we're doing important work on this podcast. Yeah, that's definitely my my belief, and I will take it to the grave. But look, to answer your question, what does feel like it's developing is a struggle between two versions of one world government, a top down version that is the GRC, the elites are back, we're going to take care of you, we're paternalistic, we're cop focused, we're carceral justice, all of that. And then we have this bottom up one world government belief system from the flag smashers. As we've talked about before, the problem there is that it's unclear how it would work. So neither of these feel like a great answer. One of them is cold at best, sinister at worst, and anyone who's promoting John Walker is already suspicious. But the other one feels like it knows how to tear things down and no plan for building back up. So that's kind of my concern, is that neither of these feel like a good answer. Do either of them appeal to you more than the other? Neither one particularly appeals to me. Part of it is because we haven't gotten a real definition of what it is they want to do. But I thought that depot scene where the Flag Smashers break in and then blow up the depot was indicative of why these models don't necessarily work either apart or together. Because it was literally one organization set up to deliver these goods to people being attacked by the other organization to deliver those goods to a different set of people. And given that we don't know what the plans were or are necessarily, we can't judge which one would have been the more effective route. But again, looking at the parallels between the two, it's hard to look at this and say, okay, well, I'm going to root for one over the other because clearly they have the better intent in mind or even necessarily the better way of accomplishing the goal, even if I don't necessarily agree with the methods. And the forcible redistribution that the Flag Smashers are engaging in might have some moral justification behind it. If people are really wanting and these supplies are being hoarded by people who could be doing a better job of distributing them, but that's only going to achieve the short term aim of helping a few other people. Again, that might be a super important goal, but you're not actually going to convince a lot of people that this is the way to go because people get scared and turned off by really violent groups. If you start murdering a bunch of people, I'm not sure you're convincing them that you can be trusted to govern. And I agree with that. Then again, the whole world is built on violence. And so, I don't know, Charlemagne's probably like, I killed a bunch of people and I'm a great leader and everyone loved me. So, ugh. Right. And why was the super soldier wrapped in a flag better than the super soldier with a hockey mask on? Yeah. It's like, do you have an answer to that? The, the the top level answer is that I do think it's the 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 violence of small differences where the GRC Ooh. is backed by governments and the flag measures aren't. Ultimately, they have the same goal, but it's unclear whether this goal is actually what the people who they claim to be serving want or need. Part of it is because it's a six episode series. But when I look at this show, we don't actually see the people in need. 
we see mm. the flag smashers we see a little bit of the grc but so far we haven't actually seen what the scope of the need is and how these actions are impacting that need whether they're making it worse making it better making it unequal or equalizing it we just don't know at this point yeah well these questions have left me pretty uncomfortable jesse so mission accomplishment oh, well done <laughs> I think that's a good place to leave it, man. Thank you for that. You're welcome. You're a font of knowledge, Jesse. So where can people find and follow you? You can find me on Twitter at Jesse L. Taylor, all one word. Okay, legendary listeners, that is our show for today. Marvelous TV Club has a ton more in store for you throughout the rest of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier series. And of course, we're going to get into Loki and Ms. Marvel and all of that afterwards. So if you get a chance, please subscribe, tell a friend, leave a five-star review on Apple, Everybody says that for a reason. It's because it makes a huge difference on our ability to be discovered and for other people to take the podcast seriously. So we'd really appreciate it. All right, Jesse, let's go found Latveria, shall we? I mean, if it hasn't been split up already, but I have a feeling we'll be able to find some land and get our true kingdom started. Castle it is. All right. Yes. <laughs>